Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome into this virtual space. I'm just seeing a few people trickle in again or keep they're continuing to trickle in. So um, I have a kind of a long introduction. So I'm just going to go ahead and start. And um, hopefully by the time I reach the end of it, our audience will have settled and Louise and Susan can begin their, their conversation. Um, like I said, welcome everyone to the space, to this Montana Book Festival event. It is featuring uh, Louise Wagonette and Susan Marsh. Uh, they're here for a conversation about Shadows on the Klamath, A Woman in the Woods. This is three of three, Shadows on the Klamath and the, con uh, the completion of a memoir trilogy. This is uh, number three of Louise's memoirs. Uh, this event is sponsored by a number of different organizations and businesses, including Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, The Whitefish Review, Humanities Montana, and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. An enormous thank you to all of our sponsors, uh, those that I just read and others included. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. I am zooming in as I am usually for these events uh, from my office in the Mountain Press Publishing Company building here in Missoula, Montana. The Montana Book Festival acknowledges that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. The name Missoula comes from the Bitterroot Salish word in Missoula, which means place of freezing water. This name has been used for over 12,000 years since the existence of Glacial Lake Missoula. The first Europeans who came here borrowed the Salish term in Missoula and modified the word to Missoula. Later, when Glacial Lake Missoula melted, the Bitterroot Salish began using an additional term for Missoula, which means place of the small bull trout. In 1855, the Bitterroot Salish were forced to sign the Hellgate Treaty, and following that treaty, the United States government carried out forced assimilation, removal, and genocide against the Salish and other peoples in their efforts to acquire land. Yet despite centuries of colonial theft and oppression, the Tutuaktan people are still here and thriving on their Aboriginal lands. The Montana Book Festival strives, and we will continue to strive, to help promote Indigenous voices as one of the ways our organization acknowledges and respects the Aboriginal peoples of Missoula. Uh, for those of you zooming in from outside Missoula, including our authors, I encourage you to let us know where you're zooming in to, from into the chat there. Um, and, and speaking of the chat, uh, a few logistics before the conversation begins tonight. I'd like to invite you attendees to submit your questions for Louise and Susan via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see that there's a Q&A and there's a chat. Uh, the Q&A is for questions, the chat, conversation. I'll be throwing links out to books so you can purchase Louise memoirs. Um, but yeah, if you have a question for Susan or Louise, please relegate those to the, the Q&A specifically. Um, your questions will be addressed throughout the hour. Um, Susan's going to read them when they pop up. So feel free to do so when you have them. Um, if you have any questions about events, about the Montana Book Festival, go ahead and throw those into the chat, though. I, will, I, can, I can take care of logistical concerns in that way. Um, I want to note that if you're interested in purchasing Louise's memoir or her memoirs, you can do so through our festival bookseller, Fact and Fiction Books here in Missoula, Montana, at factandfictionbooks.com. Please be sure to enter MBF at checkout so that 20% of those sales do come back to the festival. Um, and that checkout code is for online, as I said, um, but also in store. If you're here in Missoula and you wanna, you wanna um, use that code, you can just say MBF to the bookseller. So with that out of the way, I would love to introduce our writers tonight. Louise Wagonette was born in Boise, Idaho and raised near the Klamath River in Northwestern California. She graduated from California State University, Chico, with a degree in English and studied range, botany, forestry, and wildlife management at Humboldt State University. She worked for the US Forest Service for more than 30 years and has been widely anthologized. She lives in Idaho. Welcome, Louise. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you very much for to the Montana Book Festival. And uh, of course, thank you for or to Oregon State University Press. Yes, definitely to the publisher. And Susan Marsh is a naturalist and award-winning writer in Jackson, Wyoming, with over 30 years experience as a wildland steward for the US Forest Service. She holds degrees in geology and landscape architecture. Her life has been devoted to conservation of public land and a deeper understanding of the relationship between people and wild country. Her essays have appeared in many magazines and anthologies. Her first novel, War Creek, was released in uh, 2014, and A Hunger for High Country, One Woman's Journey to the Wild in Yellowstone Country, was also released in 2014. A hearty welcome to you, Susan, and a hearty welcome to you both. Welcome. 
Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, here we are. Hi, Susan. It's great to be <laughs> Hi. Here. <laughs> would, would you like to introduce your work to our audience with a short reading before we start going into Q&A? Yes, I'll, uh, I, I, I can start. Um, yeah, this is, this is a book about um, the years I worked for the Forest Service uh, on the Happy Camp Ranger District of the Klamath National Forest, uh, where, where I worked from 1973 to 1987. And uh, when I first started working there, um, I was the receptionist, and this did not always go well. Um, the The man I was working for at the time, who was the administrative officer, he uh, he he found he found much in my work not to be happy about. Although um, the district clerk Maud Ellis uh, was very kind to me, and and uh, she thought I was doing pretty well. But um, I'll, I'll read you an excerpt of some of my travails. Um, I, was, I wasn't the world's greatest receptionist, and I knew it. But Maud seemed to think I was learning fast, for she had given me a glowing report on my three-month evaluation back in February. Her review came as a relief, for I knew my limitations. In those days, long before receptionists came to be called frontliners in the Forest Service, the agency typically reserved the position for the last hired woman, when what was needed was a grizzled veteran prepared to deal with whatever weirdness came in the front door. I, I did have some advantages. I knew the landscape and where the best camping and fishing places were and how much snow was on top of the grayback road to Oregon. I also knew how to schmooze with loggers. My screw-ups inevitably involved other agency people. In addition to making dozens of verbal faux pas, especially on the telephone, I couldn't seem to nail down the smooth fictions with which gatekeepers shield their, shield their bosses from unwelcome visitors. I tended to forget names and procedural details and couldn't seem to think on my feet. I was, however, very good at reading the weather station in the lower parking lot every morning, a task I enjoyed because the rain gauges, thermometers, scales, and fuel moisture sticks were never unhappy to see me. At first, I rarely knew who was in or out of the office, which frequently got me into trouble until one of the senior foresters took pity on me and installed a sign-in, sign-out chalkboard on the wall in the hall behind my desk. The district ranger didn't want to be in to anyone short of his boss, the forest supervisor. But since he neglected to tell me this in words of one syllable, I jauntily waved logging contractors down the hall to his office whenever they showed up. Then I wondered why he glared at me later when I passed him in the hall. Uh, I didn't want to irritate the line and staff officers, but I couldn't seem to help myself. Since spelling and grammar were two of my strong points, I felt confident enough on to correct some errors in a sale administrator's letter. Dwayne stomped up to my desk, threw down the offending missive, and demanded that I change it back. Oh, just type it in the way he has it, Joan said, rolling her eyes at Duane's retreating back. Except for the spelling, of course. He'll be back tomorrow with more changes anyway. Joan was a retired stockbroker from Chicago who lived with two other women on a mining claim downriver. She knew all about giving the customer what he thought he wanted. I learned never to make assumptions about how rich someone was by how they dressed she told me once. One time I met with a customer that the other brokers walked away from because he wore a threadbare suit. I found out he was a millionaire and I got his whole account. Most of the men in the building, however, seemed happy that I could decipher their scrawls and produce some kind of typed letter by the next day. I could read bad handwriting and was rather proud of that ability. So I didn't worry much about Duane. And as I passed down the halls distributing telephone messages, 
as I devoured pamphlets on tree diseases in the lunchroom and asked questions about what I read as I, as I filed new directives in the rows of loose leaf forest service manuals and handbooks on the shelves, I thought of a career plan. But any such plan required that I keep my current job for at least a year to reach the relative security of career conditional status. And as I gnawed on my lunch, the morning's department meeting haunted me. Uh, there is a little a little sample of life mm -hmm. in the front office of a Forest Service office in the early 70s. Yeah, and yeah, I remember the early 70s, why there was no uh, computer there. Everything was done. The men scrawled on a yellow pad and handed yeah. it to somebody to cart down to you to type up. Uh, yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, <laughs> pretty it, funny. It, exactly. <laughs> The, the, uh, the office was very proud of the fact that they had just gotten several IBM Selectric typewriters, ah. uh, which were, you know, totally amazing to us. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Indeed. And a couple of them even had automatic erasure on them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were in a richer place than I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question for you about this. I've I've read your previous two books and I thoroughly enjoyed them there. I, I think the, the people who listen to your brief reading are getting a sense of how much uh, interesting detail is, uh, you know, to completely opaque to the general public about yeah. how their national forests are being managed. And, um, and also your, um, your personal um, relationship with the agency, with your dad having worked for it, et cetera. Um, and so I just, I was curious because each, um, each of those books stands alone, you know, as an entity, but I, I didn't know if you planned on writing a whole trilogy at the beginning or if it just evolved. You know, it, it yes, thank you. Um, it did kind of evolve. Uh, in the beginning, I just wanted to write uh, a book about Hilt, uh, the little, uh -huh. uh, the little company owned town where I spent basically the first 13 years of my life. And it wasn't until after I had finished reading that that I got to thinking about uh, the larger uh, ecological world of the Klamath Mountains and, um, and how uh, after we left Hilt, we lived on the Klamath River uh, when my dad was working for the Forest Service. And, um, and, and I realized I had a lot of material that was uh, centered around the middle Klamath River and, and my basically teenage years there. And so that's when I started working on the second book. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it kind of, you know, and having, having realized, oh my gosh, I, I wrote two books. And then I realized, well, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a third chapter in there about the years that I actually worked for that same agency that it had so much to do with my childhood. And so I started, I started writing a third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, th there might be a fourth on the way, <laughs> who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's possible, it's possible. I, um, after I left the Klamath, I spent another um, a couple of decades in the Forest Service, so, so there's, uh, and in in very different places from right. from the Klamath Mountains, so who knows? There there are more stories. Yes, yeah. Um, Nobody who's worked for the Forest Service lacks for stories, yes. as far as I yes. can tell. <laughs> well, but it is kind of funny that um, you know a lot of what you and I have both written about is kind of um, how hard it is to fit in to yes. um, an agency that's kind of hidebound and, and how's all these unspoken rules, which you kept finding out that you were breaking when you first started, <laughs> but you still have this great affection for uh, not just the national forest, but the flawed, but trying its best agency that is uh, trying to take care of those forests. So um, I, I'm just curious about how your attitude about the forest service has changed and if retirement allows you to look back in some kind of different way than, than you did when you were working? Um, well, re retirement definitely gives you more time 
uh, to to meditate on on things. I th I think what it took for me to get a a more um, nuanced view of the Forest Service as a whole was actually, of course, when I left the Klamath, and and I worked. Um, uh, I worked for two other national on two other national forests after that in in two different regions, and I realized how how very different they were in some respects and yet how similar uh, because yeah they were all the same agency but they were in different areas with different cultural traditions mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I, I came to realize how, how the differences and the similarities all kind of melded together. And then uh, in the 1990s, um, where there, there was a lot of, um, there, there was a lot of controversy about Forest Service management and the Endangered right. Species Act, of course, became very, very important uh, with Forest Service management. And that's when I realized that a lot of the things that I had observed happening in the Forest Service over the past decades had been driven not by local concerns, not even by regional concerns, but by national policies. Mm -hmm. and, and I began reading uh, a lot of material that was just then coming out uh, about the the political and industrial forces that uh, that had affected the forest service and forest service man and forest management in general. And, um, and I, yeah, all of a sudden I kind of went, whoa, now I, now I know why this happened. And now I think I know why that happened. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I, I think eventually I would have realized that on my own maybe, but but moving around and meeting meeting different people and reading a lot more research that was being done made me realize uh, how closely we were tied in with national policies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, there, there was a question that came in um, that also wraps around the next thing I wanted to ask you. You started out, um, you know, as a pretty young person in a position that you know, it wasn't uh, so-called professional and stuff. And so <laughs> I, I was curious about um, what drew you to the Forest Service and whether your sense of, if for lack of a better word, kind of an environmental ethic changed or if you even had one before you started working there. And uh, because having known you for a long time, I knew you have a very strong environmental ethic, but I don't know how much of it came from the Forest Service. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of it, I think, came in spite of the Forest Service <laughs> yeah. in, in, in some ways, um, because, uh, well, I, I grew up, um, I grew up hearing my, my dad uh, talking about um, what he considered mistakes in forest management, and um, his, his background uh, before he went to um, Oregon State University and became a forester, his, his background was as a JIPO logger. Uh, so he tended to look at things from an economic point of view, like, um, gee, why, why would you cut down this stand of trees right now? You know, they're putting on an inch a year growth in diameter, you know, just leave them, leave them alone for 50 years. Don't, don't cut them down. But the Forest Service had five-year timber plans and According to the plan, yeah, we're going to log here now. Um, and uh, he, I, I would often hear him talk about um, about road construction standards, um, about how the Forest Service, when they built some of their um, their main uh, haulage roads, they tended to want a road that was pretty pretty well engineered. Yeah, on the theory that it was going to last for a long time. Uh, Dad's point of view seemed to be, no, don't do that. Just build a road to the standard that you need 
to do this timber sale and and don't worry about building a giant highway sized bridge to get to so so i kind of i kind of had that in my mind and then when i actually worked for the forest service uh, yeah i realized uh, yeah the old the old man had some good insights there um but to tell you the truth the first uh, few years that i worked for the forest service especially after i got into silviculture and was out on the ground a lot yeah i realized the forest service tends to get into these programs where they decide okay this is the right thing to do now so by golly we're we're gonna really get after it and do a lot of it um and then 10 years later everybody kind of turns around and says oops maybe we shouldn't have been doing that and uh, so the, the longer i worked for the for the agency the more um the more cynical i got about you know okay you're you're getting into this big program where you think it's a great idea to cut down hardwoods well maybe it's not maybe <laughs> um, so I, so toward the, uh, yeah, toward toward the end of my tenure with the agency, I I was um, I was pretty skeptical whenever they really got on a tear about what was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that um, I wanted to follow up on when you talked about. Um, you, know, you started out as a receptionist, right? And you know that's kind of the standard okay position for a female in the Forest Service to have, especially in the early 70s, because that's it wasn't until after some of the laws were passed in the mid 70s that the Forest Service started bringing on other than forester type professionals, right? And a sure. lot of those were women. And, and I know I faced a lot of problems um, as a professional field going person. And I just wonder um, if, well, I don't wonder, I'm sure you had the same sorts of things, but you seem to write with it about it with a great deal of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm glad it comes across like that because um, yeah, may, maybe distance helps a little. You know, at the time, at the time, I, you know, I thought, you know, oh, man, I'm so screwed. But um, but you look I look back on it now and it, it does seem um, kind of humorous in, in places that I, I sometimes I think the only way I can really uh, write about it is is to try to find a little humor in it, because looking back on it, it was kind of funny. I, I was this pretty clueless um young woman in my early 20s and uh um i was i was i was too naive to realize i was trying to do something that hardly anybody had done before i, I was trying wow. to jump from a receptionist into a field position when i i didn't really have the education to do it and i know that you and and a lot of other um uh, women who got into the Forest Service about that time, you were fortunate enough to actually have a degree in a field that the Forest Service had decided, okay, we need people in this field. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, th therefore, we're going to hire wildlife biologists, we're going to hire botanists. We're, and, and, oh my God, some of them are going to be women. Holy cow. <laughs> um, I, I think maybe one thing that made things a tad easier for me was that I was going back to a place where I'd gone to high school. I, I knew a lot of these people. I, I knew the area. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I could, I, I knew how to kind of talk the talk. And, and I, I think sometimes people looked at me and they were kind of just humoring me, you know, thinking I'd come to my senses and, you know, decide I wanted to be a bookkeeper or something, but uh, uh, but but they were always they were always um, you know tolerant of me. I guess uh, that's good. That's yeah, good. To, to be yeah. tolerated is definitely um, uh, one of the better outcomes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I uh, wanted to ask you too. Uh, um, you know, I, I was in touch with a, um, 
a black woman who was the first forester who was hired by the Forest Service. And um, she uh, wrote an unbelievable article in uh, Mountain Journal about her experiences. And she told me that they're making a documentary out of this. So I can't oh wait. My gosh. But um, it, it reminded me of uh, Gloria Brown's memoir, Black Woman in Green. And yes. uh, she became a forest supervisor. And was she the first Black woman forest supervisor? Or do you know? Um, as far as I know, she was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I, I have. Um, it's on my to be read pile. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, I got a little sidetracked over the last couple months, but, um, yeah, but right. yes, I, I really want to read that book. I'm, and I'm so sorry she's passed away. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I, you know, I will say just as an aside, some of the people who responded to me after a hunger for high country came out were men and they said, you know, except for the female thing, I endured all the same stuff because I was a soil scientist or a, you know, yes. hydrologist or not, you know, a timber beast, yeah. basically. So anyway, uh, yeah. let's move on. I want to look yeah. and see if other people have questions here. Um, oh, somebody asked, what's it like being a woman? But um, um, we just talked about that. Is it true that the Forest Service wanted a road every 1,000 to 2,000 feet through timber areas? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the Forest Service in general actually wanted, but I know on the Klamath, that's basically what they ended up with, mm. um, you know, in, in places where there was valuable timber and it was gettable. Yeah, they were, they were building roads about every 1500 feet right up the slope. Uh -huh. Yeah, wow. which was, you know, caused a lot of damage. I, uh, I, I remember the first, um, I think it was the first hydrologist on the um, on the Happy Camp District. Yeah, he yeah he earned himself some hate and discontent when he was pointing out that you know maybe it isn't a really good idea to build this many roads in decomposed granite. Um, mm. Yeah, on and, steep slopes. <laughs> on steep slopes. Yeah the, yeah, the Forest Service foresters didn't like to hear that. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you know, since those days, you know, we had a period where ecosystem management was the new buzzword. And um, I thought that was kind of a, I mean, not, when I say managing ecosystems, I mean, managing the way people behave so that the ecosystem manages to stay alive. But um, now it's climate change is the big uh, buzzword, it seems like with the Forest Service. And I wonder, if you have any perspective on, um, you know, I've been retired for 12 years, so I don't really know what they're doing on this um, and um, if they're doing anything. Um, that's a good question. And yeah, I've been retired since 2005 also. And mm, okay. um, so, yeah, I'm not sure what their, how much climate change comes into the, you know, monthly staff meetings. To tell you the truth, I, yeah. I know it, it kind of gets used as a buzzword a lot more than it used to. As, yeah, as well as yeah. I, yeah. I, I worry that that's all it is. And, you know, with um, with the uh, talks in Glasgow the last couple of days and yeah. President Biden said, we're going to preserve more forest. At the same time, we're trying to manipulate more forest to reduce the threat of wildfire. You know, which is it going to be and how are we going to? you know, are we going to make this happen? It's all yeah. very interesting. <laughs> it, it, it is that on, on the one hand, I, I tend to um, come down on the idea that, you know, if you, if you have, if you have a forest with, you know, giant old growth trees and they're still there, by golly, you should leave them alone. Yeah. Um, un unless, you know, unless there's some, overriding concern um i um I've, i followed with interest uh the the dixie fire and the calder fire this yeah. summer in northern california it wasn't really an, it wasn't an area that i ever worked in but i had spent some time in both of those areas and and uh and you could kind of tell where 
um, where thinning might do some good uh, when it comes to having a making a fire lay down. But there were other places where you go, you know, it's not going to help uh, if you get a hot enough fire and it's driven by a wind. It's going to go wherever it wants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of that. Um, I I once worked in southeastern Oregon where. Uh, the the way to manage timber was to high grade all the old growth ponderosa pine and wow. the incense pine and all these big trees and leave the white fir. And yeah. so guess what burned less this summer? <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like um, yeah. the opposite of what should be done. But I think it was all driven by uh, what products do the mills want? They didn't yeah. have any use for that um, true fir. And apparently they are starting to use it now. So yeah. Yeah, that that uh, I I remember the the deal about white fur because yeah, white fur it's it doesn't uh, yeah it doesn't make a very high quality product and in addition you know if you're going to thin in a white fur area you have to be very careful about how you log because white fur has thin bark and uh, yeah. it's real easy to uh, to damage it and then you get rot and then it's not worth anything so. Right. Uh, but it's essentially, yeah, it's essentially a tree that that took advantage of a situation in which there were very few lightning fires that were allowed to get big. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. old ponderosa pine, sugar pine, old growth dug fir, they, they could handle uh, a fire, but it would kill white fir. And then all of a sudden we're doing stuff that encourages white fir. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe maybe we're learning something. <laughs> maybe. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to a couple of the questions that came in um, while we were talking. Um, uh, someone has asked about um, uh, Hilt, uh, California, being oh, a mill yeah. town, and and uh, this uh, person wonders if you've read a book by Carrie Arsenault. It's called Mill Town, but it's in Maine. Uh, do you know yeah. that book? You know, I've heard of that book. I haven't read it yet. Okay. Uh, oh, good. Another one for the to be read pile. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I just got a little uh, note here saying Montana Book Festival would like to answer it live. So oh. I don't know if that means they're going to come in and do it or what. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it's one of it's a book that I have heard about, but I have not read it. So, all right. I will write that down. Yeah. Um, another question was uh, why did you write a memoir? Um, rather than something more, uh, from what I'm gathering, a little more academic. Um, in, you know, like they, they say environmental studies based. I, I guess because uh, uh, I'm not an academic and I guess, <laughs> I guess I didn't have much confidence in my ability to do all the research and basically go back to school and get a master's degree, which is, which may have been a good idea. Um, and, you know, and, and write a more scientifically based uh, account of, of the Klamath Mountains and the forests. Uh, so I, I, um, I kind of came down on it from, you know, what was it like growing up there? Yeah, because that, that was what I knew. That, that was what I knew. Also, it, it was just, there's something about memoir. People who write memoirs sometimes say, um, I just, I had to write this. And I, and I think that was part of it. Uh, right. Yeah, it well, was, I think the way you weave the science and the, the management stuff into the personal narrative works very well. And to me, it's a much um, more inviting read than if it was more academic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I think there is something to be said for telling a story. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you're you're telling a story about people and hopefully getting the readers interested in what happens. Yeah. 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 And it is a lot about the people as well as the yeah. resource. So, oh, yeah. 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 Um, one more person has a question. What is your daily conversation uh, look like now that you're retired? <laughs> I don't daily. know if they want to know if you're still yeah. talking about the Forest Service or not. <laughs> Am I talking to my cats or? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Daily conversation. Well, um, 
I, I basically uh, li live with um, yeah my my mother and my husband and and uh, <laughs> these days my husband and I talk a lot about football. <laughs> oh. He's he's very apologies to Oregon State, but he's very concerned about the Ducks right now. Oh, so yeah, um, so uh, I I guess it's uh, yeah yeah I have a. I have a lot of conversations, of course, with uh, my, my, it's interesting, my, my brother, my, my little brother, Tom, um, uh, we, we tend, we tend to have more philosophical dis discussions uh, on the phone quite often about, mm. yeah, climate change in the world and politics and yeah. Yeah. are any of us going to survive? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, daily conversations. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to characterize. Yeah, that. I read it wrong. Somebody just corrected me. I I need new glasses, obviously. No, the question was your daily conservation work. Oh, my daily um, conservation work. Yeah, I'm sorry. Work. Oh. Yes, that is okay. what the question was about. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> okay. Uh, daily conservation work. Well, I I belong I belong to a couple of uh, conservation groups, uh, uh, regional conservation groups, and I keep up with them. And uh, basically, try to uh, write letters. Um, I I comment on Forest Service and BLM uh, projects. Um, not sure they ever pay attention, but um, <laughs> but they <laughs> they they always say thank you. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, for a while. Um, we're not quite sure what the future holds, but I was on a, um, uh, let's see, a, a local, basically citizens group that came together to, um, to make comments upon a proposed uh, forest service uh, forest plan uh, uh -huh. here on, here on the local forest. And, uh, and we, we did, quite a bit of, uh, we did quite a bit of research and commenting and uh, uh, getting together over about two years. And then unfortunately the forest kind of hit a wall and decided they were going to postpone uh, writing a new plan. So, so right now we're kind of all sitting back and going, okay, what's next? Well, you know, that work won't go to naught because even no. if the plan gets put back a year or whatever, it's still worthwhile. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we, we did, we had a lot of input and, uh, uh, and I think eventually it'll, it'll be useful. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, one would hope. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the Forest Service is, as we all know, they're like a lot of federal land management agencies. They um, they are pulled in several different directions right now. Yeah. Here's another good question. I'm glad this one got answered because your book is so good on this. Uh, does your book address more issues with and about the Indian nations on the Klamath? Um, the, uh, my books or my latest book? Your latest one, my latest I think. Book. Yeah. You know, I, I don't really talk about that except a little bit, uh, um, ma mainly because uh, uh, I guess I didn't, how do I put this? Um, what's kind of neat is between the time I was a kid in Happy Camp and, and now the, the, uh, the Karuk tribe, that yeah. that was always their home, and they have really um, they have really come around to being a a political force, and which is wonderful to see. And uh, so I I didn't really talk about it. Um, I I do make mention of the fact that um, the the Forest Service was actually kind of messing around with um, forests, especially. Tan oak forests and sugar pine stands that the the Karooks had been managing for many thousands of years, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, mainly using fire. Uh, and the, the Forest Service just kind of, you know, jumped in and acted as though that hadn't happened uh, or that it wasn't important. And um, so I realized, uh, especially toward the latter end of the 70s, we were, we were doing, we were trying to convert uh, tan oak stands to Douglas fir and ponderosa pine plantations. And we were literally clear cutting um, tan oak stands, which was incredibly, in my opinion, stupid because these, these stands had been managed uh, in a quiet way mm -hmm. by Karuk families, mm -hmm. you know, forever. And, um, you know, it was, it was quote unquote public land. But what a lot of us didn't realize was, you know, there are still Indian families that go out there and gather uh, tan oak acorns Mm -hmm. off the same places where their families have been doing it, you know, for thousands of years. Right. Um, yeah. And we're acting as though this isn't going on. Um, so yeah. fortunately, this was a short-lived uh, mm -hmm. uh, mistake. <laughs> and uh, it pretty much came to a halt uh, in a couple of years. But, uh, but it, it was just something we were clueless about. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and no one thought to ask them, right? Ex exactly. That was that was one of the things that you know. Hey, let's let's go ask them. And uh, uh, but although in Happy Camp it was, it was kind of interesting because um, Happy Camp um, had so many Native Americans who who in many respects were like all of their neighbors. You know, they, they worked in the woods, they worked in the mill. Um, they, they had family traditions, but mm -hmm. they were kind of under the radar. Yeah. And so for a long time, you know, before there was a tribal council, before there was a tribal chairman to, to really ask about those things, the, the, there were attempts by, um, by the local groups to come to the Forest Service and say, hey, hey, don't do that. You know, that that area is important to my family. And sometimes the local uh, Forest Service management would listen and sometimes they wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Now, now they listen a lot more. I'm um, glad. Yeah. Not, not, not as much as they should, perhaps, but right. they do listen. Yeah. Well, I remember reading a section that maybe it struck me, uh, even though it was a small bit of the entire book, where you were talking about how, not just for the tan oak, but for the forest in general, its health was uh, maintained by the, the way the fires were burning to manage for the kind of resources that they needed for their livelihood and not to feed a mill or to meet a timber target. And right. which when, you know, when, our foresters came along, um, we did things the opposite way. Yeah. And um, now maybe there's a chance to turn that back. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping so. It's, uh, you know, I don't think it's a panacea. I think it was a combination of, of um, you know, Native Americans uh, manipulating, um, manipulating plant life with mm -hmm. about the only tool they had, which was fire. Uh, plus the fact that um, the, the Klamath Mountains um, have a lot of lightning fires, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, mm -hmm. of course the Karuks didn't go out and fight fires. They, if there was a lightning fire, well, okay. Um, so so it, was, it was partly passive and, and partly active. Uh, they would, yeah, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I do mention, um, uh, an episode where, you know, huckleberry patches that had been consistently uh, burned off by Native Americans when the Forest Service uh, really started getting a handle on uh, not allowing people to do their own control burning. Um, yeah, a lot of the huckleberry patches just disappeared uh, because of plant succession. Right. So, and everybody goes, well, where'd they go? Well, yeah, they were they were they were a garden. They were maintained by bur by burning, and yeah. when you stop, it goes away. 
Yeah. 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 I had a question that's it's kind of um, more, well, it almost goes to all three books, but um, the way um, the, your lives as Forest Service employees and families, um, back in the olden days, everybody lived on the compound at the district office and they lived and worked together. And so there was a really close knit community. And even the people who didn't work for the Forest Service, like the spouses and kids got conscripted into helping with things. And um, I just, it just seems like a, a kind of a um, nostalgic time because so much of that is changing. And I, I'm just interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, that I, I think in the beginning, um, well, I, I think about when uh, in 1962, when my dad joined the Forest Service and we moved to Happy Camp, uh, that was, a, it was pretty darn isolated. The, the, road, uh, the road was very windy and long and twisty and uh, people in Happy Camp sort of had to be self-sufficient. And uh, yeah, forest Serv the Forest Service, they, they were kind of set apart because, oh, okay, you're government employees and a lot of you come from far away. And so mm -hmm. you know, they sort of banded together for self-protection in yeah. a way. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, they, there were a lot of, there were a lot of parties, get togethers that were just for a service. And, um, yeah, it, it was very close knit. I mean, and there were on, on the Klamath, there were, uh, ranger stations that were even more isolated than happy camp. There was Yukonam and the, and the Salmon River ranger yeah. districts. And, uh, yeah, people really were thrown together there. Um, so and not I, very I, many of them, <laughs> and, like and very few of them, yes, <laughs> and not very many of them. And uh, I mean that that changed later when the when the roads got better, and mm -hmm. and uh, well, and I noticed it, you know, when um, when I left the Klamath, the the Forest Service people weren't as close knit, and it was because they weren't quite as isolated. Um, mm -hmm. They they were able to get out once in a while. Uh, there, there wasn't as much of a, a focus on living on the ranger station. And uh, although there were, um, uh, you know, on the Salmon Chalice where I uh, uh, worked the last quite a few years of my career, um, there were a couple of ranger districts that were pretty close knit because uh, they were a long way from anywhere. Um, my, most weren't, but, um, you know, people kind of, it, it was more, it was more of a job, you know, you went home and you hung out with your family or your friends and, mm -hmm. and there wasn't quite so much emphasis as on, uh, forest service people. Yeah. 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 Um, getting back to fires, there a question has come in about, um, you know, what do you see, given all the fires that we've had this past year and, ones that we can probably expect in the coming years. Um, are we gonna see like a, a complete change in the um, structure of the forest, whereas certain species are moving out and others are coming in or um, what's the future look like in your opinion? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked me that um, because um, I see and there have been several actual um, uh, scientific papers written um, about what's happening um, with forests and how literally we're having species change, uh, tree species change. Uh, there was one paper that I that I mentioned. Um, I think the the links in in the bibliography. Um, where the people that wrote the paper said, basically the Klamath National Forest is shifting from a conifer dominated ecosystem to a hardwood dominated ecosystem mm -hmm. because the, the hardwoods on the Klamath are the ones that re-sprout after burning. And um, mm -hmm. I, um, uh, I actually finished quote unquote, the book uh, just before the Slater fire, uh, which, 
which uh, just burned out the basically the entire Indian Creek drainage just north of uh, just north of Happy Camp, yeah. and uh, 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 this this uh, this fall, thanks to the magic of YouTube, someone posted a video of them driving up Indian Creek and then driving over what they call the Grayback Road into Oregon, mm -hmm. and of course the whole drainage has been burned, but it was kind of cool because you could see uh, just off to the side as they started to drive up the Grayback Road. Here is all, here are all these um, madrones and black oak and, and other oaks, and they're all sprouting from their stumps. Mm -hmm. And you go, yeah, this, this is what's going to be there. Uh, it's 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 going to be less of a mixed conifer forest and more of a of a hardwood uh, forest, and th that's just what's going to be able to survive uh, these big fires. Um, we're we're not um, on the Klamath, you know. Unlike um, you know your part of the world and where I live now, we have a lot of uh, lodgepole pine, which actually needs pretty hot fire to, to, uh, for the cones to open and, and the seeds to sprout. But on the Klamath, we, we really didn't have that except for, uh, there's, there's one species whose name now escapes me, but, um, and, and they're, they, they reproduce in the same way as lodgepole, but, uh, they're, uh, but they're a very minor species. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the hardwoods bless them. They, they keep coming back. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I, I read a, just a couple of days ago, uh, a friend who still lives in Happy Camp uh, after that, that big rainstorm that hit the Pacific coast, uh, you know, the water came up and, uh, mm -hmm. And I've read an account of just, you know, Indian Creek just turned black and a lot of ash and mud coming down. And yeah. which is very, very sad because, because he had just a couple of days before seen uh, some steelhead uh, in the yeah. creek. And so, you know, their, their, their eggs aren't, aren't going to make it. Probably. Right. It's, it's, yeah. uh, so it's, it's going to take several years to wash all the uh, yeah the mud out. Well, that was kind of after Mount St. Helens blew up. A couple oh, of yes. major rivers had the same thing going on. And, yeah. But it the nature resiliency is so amazing when you stand back and let it happen. Yes. I, I can imagine the roots of all those hardwoods are going to hang on to that soil pretty well. Oh, oh yes, that that is one good thing, and and uh, and also. You know, we're, um, the uh, the seeds of things um, uh, like uh, ceanothus are yeah. are going to sprout, and and I, I can remember back when I was um, in silviculture and planting trees. Sometimes uh, we we'd be planting a, a clear cut that had been we had burned it to get rid of the slash uh, the year before. And we're in there planting trees and we're counting literally like 40,000 Ceanothus sprouts per acre. Right. right. So <laughs> that, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a good thing, as they say, because um, it, it holds the soil down and they, nice. uh, and they actually are a nitrogen fixer mm -hmm. and, uh, and they provide, you know, food for deer and things. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, nature does heal itself. Yeah, it does. Well, we're, we're coming up on six o'clock. We got about five minutes left. I, I just oh my to, heavens! It, yeah, I know it goes fast, huh? <laughs> if anybody else has a question, um, this is the time. <laughs> now is the time. Now is the time. <laughs> Maybe not. May or or not. Yes. Um, I'm looking, looking at the chat a little bit. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right.
Yeah. Well, if no one has any more questions, um, perhaps this is a good a good time to to kind of end things. Um, unless Louise, you want to read anything else, or uh, Susan, you have any additional questions? No, um, I don't. Okay. Oh. Well, and well, I, I'm I'm going to I'm I'm going to turn it about and get in a little plug for Susan and ask her if she's working on anything now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> book wise um, yes book wise oh I've set books aside um, I have a poetry chat book coming out <laughs> that's right, about it right. <laughs> but that's yeah, I've just been writing some short um, essays and stuff for Mountain Journal and that's I don't have a long book in the at least that I know of yet so that's that's okay but thanks for asking <laughs> yeah yeah well and Yes, and, and, and I love your paintings also. Thank you. <laughs> Louise, what about you? Now that um, this, this you know, third <laughs> memoir is coming out, are you, are you planning on publishing something else in the near uh, future? Well, I'm, I'm hoping, not, I wouldn't say near future. Uh, I'm, I, am, I am slow, I am <laughs> slow, but maybe, uh, but I, I do have a couple books in mind. Um, I, I thought of uh, an experience that I had in the Sierra Nevada mountains many years ago. And I realized thinking over uh, that episode in my life that it was possible to fictionalize it and turn it into a murder mystery. Oh boy. So, oh, so you're writing some fiction. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> So, so maybe a complete change of pace uh, would would work for that, and uh, um, yeah, and and I would eventually. I I kid people that that I actually have in mind a uh, uh, a memoir about working on the Salmon Chalice National Forest, which I. I, I have a title. I, my, my title is Lewis and Clark ate lunch here. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know if it will ever happen, but um, but I, I definitely have have a lot of material there. I'm sure you do. Yeah. yeah. You're probably waiting for a few people to die before you <laughs> bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Sadly, we're we're all. Uh, the two of us are reaching the age where um, people younger than us are keeling over. So I know it's uh, sad. Yeah, which is very sad, and also mm -hmm. kind of makes you want to. Uh, uh, okay, get on the stick. <laughs> Start writing yeah. this down. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. This was yes. great fun, and it yes. was nice to talk to with Louise. Yes. Yeah, thank you wonderful. both, Louise and Susan, for this really, really great and uh, far-reaching conversation. Um, thank you for joining the festival with this event. And thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank you for your great, great questions. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you again to our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, The Whitefish Review, as well as Humanities Montana and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington, Washington Foundation. Pardon. And just a reminder, I know I was throwing links in the chat, but you can purchase Louise's memoirs and you can purchase Susan's books too at Fact and Fiction Books. Be sure to ent enter MBF at checkout, whether you're uh, buying online at factandfictionbooks.com or in store with one of your booksellers. So again, Louise, Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank, thank you. you. This and great. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for hosting us. Yes, oh, thank you my, so much. My, our pleasure. Definitely. All right. Have a wonderful right. evening, everyone.